Kathy Peterson, a volunteer with the Dayton Area Chamber of Commerce. You are watching Business Connection, a program produced by the Dayton Area Chamber of Commerce. The Chamber is committed to finding business solutions by collaborating with regional business leaders on key issues. Our guest today is State Senator Peggy Lehner. Senator Lehner, always a pleasure to see you and to have you across from me. It's great to have you here. Pleasure to be here. It seems that I see you in front of so many important initiatives for our community, and one of the top ones is education, and that's what we're going to be talking about today, so I'm very excited about that. During your time serving in the Senate and now as Senate Education Committee Chair, Committee Chair, you've been a staunch advocate for educational reform for mm -hmm. Ohio's children. Could you give our audience an overview of the new Ohio Learning Standards, also known as Common Core? Sure. I'd be happy to, Kathy. Um, you know, learning standards are fairly new in the education realm. As we've transitioned from the industrial age to the technology information age, the need for very specific knowledge has become more and more evident. Um, so in the last 10, 20 years, states across the nation have been developing what are known as learning standards. Ohio adopted their first set of standards in 2001. And learning standards are specifically what does a child need to know? It's not how it's taught or who teaches it, but rather what do they need to know? And so we developed those, a set of state standards back in 2001. And um, in the meantime, there's been a national effort uh, led by this, the um, superintendents of schools across the country and the National Governors Association to come up with a common set of standards um, that could be as valid in California as they are in Ohio, et cetera, et cetera. So Ohio adopted what are known as the Common Core States, Common Core State Standards um, in English and Math. They, had, they um, adopted their own set of standards in social studies, science, uh, financial literacy, phys ed, art, and, and a couple of other subjects. Combined, all of those standards composed um, the Ohio Learning Standards. And they're, they're, they're a roadmap um, for our schools, our districts across the state um, in, as to what students need to know. How do they differ from the old standards, I guess? You know, you talked about how we've transitioned really from, you know, the, uh, whether it's a manufacturing community like uh, mm -hmm. the Miami Valley uh, into more of a technology-based. Okay. Well, they, they differ in a couple of, of important ways. Um, one is that they are based on what does a student need to know to be successful in college and career. And so they, they start with that premise and they work backwards. So what do you need to know when you graduate from high school? What do you need to know in ninth grade, tenth grade, and on down, all the way down to first grade? So that's the primary difference. The second one is that we have become acutely aware that our students are falling further and further behind their international peers in creativity, in problem solving, and some of those types of skills. So the new standards, particularly those in English and, and math, um, are designed to help students take information, manipulate that information to actually solve a problem. When the new standards were uh, adopted in 2010, how were they received? With very little, really no opposition. Um, they were brought before the state school board. Um, there were hearings in both the House and the Senate um, over what the, what the standards consisted of. Um, there were over 10,000 um, pieces of, of input and feedback from across the state from teachers, parents, et cetera. Um, but overall, it was not a process that parents engaged in. Um, uh, this is kind of a technical piece of education. Um, you know, I have, the, I have the standards here in front of me, and I would highly recommend that people actually read them before they object to them. Um, but they don't exactly read like, a, you know, a great novel. You'd have a little, you'd <laughs> take a few cups of coffee um, to, to um, plow through them. They are a technical thing, in much the way a surgeon, you know, how do you do a particular surgical case is not something the average layperson would probably want to read. <laughs> but we but hope that they at least look at it. Right. Yes. <laughs> well, over the last year or so, you know, we've 
seen a rise in national debate when it comes around Common Core and within mm -hmm. Ohio as well. Now, the Dayton Chamber has taken a public position in support of Ohio's new learning standards as vital for the future of our workforce development in our state. Now, could you describe the importance of these standards as it relates to future workforce needs in the economic vitality of Ohio? Uh, they're absolutely critical to that. And, and one of the reasons behind the development of the, of the Common Core Standards in the first place um, by the National School Chiefs was a recognition that there was a disconnect between what our students knew, know and what they need to know to be successful in the job, in the workforce. So they really paid very close attention as they developed these standards to what, what did we need in our workforce? What, what did we need to be teaching our students to have that success? And so, you know, for businesses, I can't think of anyone who has a more uh, vested interest in the outcome of our students' education than the business community. These are not only their workforce, but these are their future customers. And so that everyone has uh, um, those tools that they're going to need to be successful, both in the workforce and as consumers, uh, is, is critical. As we've gone through the process, what are some of the misconceptions that people have uh, about these standards? Oh my maybe gosh. causing the debate. Uh, do we have all day? <laughs> 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 there are so many misconceptions, which is one of the things that has made this very difficult to debate because we often are not dealing with facts. Um, one is that this is a federal takeover of education. That couldn't be farther from the truth. Um, as I've said several times, these standards were developed by a consortium of state school chiefs. These are the superintendents of schools across the country, the National Governors Association. The fact that it had that broad base support um, doesn't make it a federal takeover. But truthfully, when it comes to education, um, you know, a child in California needs to know how in kindergarten, you know, let's just take one of the standards, how to count to 100 by tens. That's as important to a child in California as it is to a child in Illinois or Ohio or Florida. Um, that's just sort of a universal skill. And the fact that something is universal does not mean that it's federally run. Unfortunately, in a way, um, what happened is after the standards were developed, um, the federal government, which was at that point putting together the Race to the Top program, said, you know, that's good. Those national standards, those standards are good. Let's encourage states to adopt career and college ready standards. And so they gave extra points in the Race to the Top application for any state that had adopted either the Common Core or another set of career and college ready standards. And that's where this notion came out that this was a national, a federal mandate of something. No one had to apply for Race to the Top. No one had to have them in there in order to have the Race to the Top application accepted. But that created that. So that was one of the big myths out there. Another one is that we were somehow trying to collect data um, that could be used, like political affiliation of a family or religious affiliation or any number of other elements out there um, data points that seem to evade privacy. Um, this is just not true. Ohio has had one of the strongest set of guidelines prohibiting the collection of personally identifiable data of any state in the country. And what we did in response to people's concerns during the budget process, the Senate put very specific guidelines into House Bill 487 um, to re-emphasize the fact that we were not going to collect data. Um, we also put together a parents advisory committee in every district has to, in order to have an opportunity to review curriculum choices um, that were contained, um, that were made based on the Common Core standards. And we also put in a, uh, a advisory panel on the Common Core itself, uh, which is composed of uh, people that are, are appointed by the governor, the senator, I mean the Senate president, and the Speaker of the House. 
um, that are content experts on each of the subject areas. And this group will look at each and every one of the standards and make sure that they are appropriate. If there's a problem with any one of them, we'll fix them, we'll change them. We have the flexibility to do that. So, you know, there's all of these things floating out there that are just need to be corrected. And it's, I really appreciate the opportunity to, you know, to speak to your audience because people hear these things and they don't know what to do with this information. And it's created a lot of anxiety. And, and it's interesting when we're talking about education, the key to making sure the, the message gets out there is education, mm -hmm. you know. <laughs> right, uh, right. Like you said, having the parent groups, mm -hmm. you know, is so important so right. that, you know, it goes to all levels. Right, yeah. right. So. Mm -hmm. Well, in terms of educational reform, what's next on your agenda in the Senate? Oh, my gosh. You know, th there are lots of different directions we can go. Um, I have been particularly bothered since I've been in the Senate, since I've been in the legislature, but even more so after this last set of report cards came out, by the huge achievement gap that we continue to see that is just growing and growing between kids in poverty and kids who are, are better off economically. And I don't think we can continue to ignore this or look away from it. I think we need to really dig down deep and, I mean, we know some of the factors that cause this. Many of these children are coming from homes um, that, are, that are in disarray. Um, they're not coming to school well fed or, or have slept well. There's a lot of trauma in many of these homes. Um, so we know those factors exist, but that can't be a reason why we don't educate the kids. So we, we need to figure out what does work. And I don't think it's so much a question of spending more money as it is a question of spending our money differently. Um, there, there may be more money that's necessary. I mean, for example, we know that early childhood education is a key, key factor um, with kids in poverty. We need to catch them up so they aren't entering kindergarten already two years behind their peers. We just can't let that continue. Um, so we need to address the early childhood issue. But there are other factors, too, that we need to understand better. We need to prepare our teachers better for how to manage a classroom with children that have difficult problems coming into the classroom. So, you know, that's, that's one really, really important um, area that I'm going to be looking at. Um, we've got to get some stability back into our school system. Uh, there's a sense from teachers that we are changing our minds constantly. Uh, the Common Core is one example. Uh, the fix for the Common Core makes it even worse. They actually have three different sets of standards in five years, um, which, you know, it just has teachers shaking in their boots. So we need to try to return some stability and work more with our teachers, with our, with our school leaders across the state. And there's, there's going to be plenty to do for the Education <laughs> Committee, let's put it that way. I have no doubt. I, I love that you touched on the early childhood education because, you know, we're seeing more organizations, Montgomery County, for example, the county commissioners, you know, challenge their yeah. employees to volunteer in the schools. And we focused on uh, the first uh, round last year or earlier this year was uh, Northridge Local Schools mm -hmm. and going to the Early Learning Center and reading to those kids one hour a day yeah and yeah. Uh, the employees so stepped up so important at the end of three months we saw the children that we read to their vocabulary scores mm -hmm. increased 17 points wow. wow that is huge yeah and how engaged they are so this uh -huh. is just it's the entire community taking part mm -hmm. in this it's not our just our government and educational system it is your businesses can do this, right? You know, and right. volunteer. So yeah. I, I, I love, and I know you've pushed yeah. for that too. So that's yeah. so exciting. I want another area program we had this summer that was just tremendously um, encouraging was a summer school program that was at offered at Trotwood and um, in Med River, and these kids were engaged. For, I think it was six weeks, might have been eight, um, in summer long learning and instead of a summer slide where they come back to school a couple months further behind than they were, these kids have caught up and they're a couple months ahead of, ahead of where they would have been yes. before. And that is exciting to see. So th there are solutions. We just have to be very creative about it and we have to be willing to 
admit what doesn't work and um, try try some new things so it's exciting it is exciting yeah. it is challenging mm -hmm. but also exciting right. now you touched on this a little bit but what more needs to be done to ensure that Ohio's learning standards are successfully implemented ex executed and supported in Ohio well I think one thing is we need to have a we need to have some patience with each other um, uh, you know we're all everyone has the interest of teaching our kids and having happy healthy children well-educated children I think everyone shares that goal whether you support the Common Core or you don't we need to give new things an opportunity to work before we judge them and one of my biggest concerns with Common Core is that we're going to throw it out when it needs tweaking we're going to throw it out all together and start from scratch and and this chaos is not good for our kids, it's not good for our teachers. Um, so I think we need to sort of speak with one voice to start saying, okay, you know, let's fix this problem, not, you know, not rebuild the whole house. Let's, you know, drive the nail in, not, you know, demolish it and start over. Um, I think the business community has started to really understand the role they play in in education and they need to be very specific about what their needs are um, and I think that's something they aren't used to used to doing I know we we kind of joke about the fact that we we turn to businesses and say you know what are you going to need in the way of workforce five years from now and they look at us like well I don't know I haven't thought about it but I think businesses are starting to do that more and more and that's enormously helpful and it helps us inform our schools as to what they need to prepare for. Um, we've, we've always seen that connection, I think, between voc ed, vocational ed, and the business community. But I think we're starting to understand that that connection is far greater than just there at that job training point. Um, and it's something that needs to go all the way through our education system. And that children at an early age need to be exposed to lots of different types of, of opportunities, and you know, not just doctor, teacher, lawyer, right. um, but you know, welder, um, you know, engineer. A lots. There's a whole array of what the opportunities are could be for kids, and, and we need to expand that. And, and we need the business community alongside of us as we try to figure out how to do that. And, and I love how you mentioned, you know, getting the young people exposed to those experiences. Uh, I know we had the Summer Youth Works program this past summer where, you know, we took 2,000 kids uh, from high school mm -hmm. and placed them in different careers, things they never would have mm -hmm. thought of. Mm -hmm. You know, you had firefighters, you had architects, you know, the business community stepping up to take these kids on to right. show them, you know, here's a career that might be of interest to you. Yeah. Yeah. that they never would have thought. never would have thought of. No, so yeah. it, it is so yeah. important. Now, as you travel across the region and the state, where have you seen examples of the community and the business community <coughs> engaging more in education efforts? Well, I think probably the gold standard is Cleveland yeah. right now. Um, they have really put together a coalition of their schools, their business community, their philanthropic community, and come together with a coherent plan that they came to the state legislature and they said, you know, can you waive some of the state regulations in this area or that area so that we can work more closely together? And that's been wonderful to see. Columbus tried to do something similar. Um, they weren't, as, they haven't been as successful to date as Cleveland has, but they're working on it. Um, Cincinnati has done, um, they've got some really exciting community learning centers where they're embedding um, medical clinics, dental clinics, optometry clinics, mental health services into their public schools. So some of those services that kids, particularly in lower dis uh, economic um, conditions, um, so desperately need. So that's been exciting to see. But the Dayton area certainly has you know, they have stepped up to the plate to learn to earn yes. um, and Tom Lasley have just, you know, they have been um, an invaluable um, asset to this community and so I see a lot of that coalition building happening right here as well and uh, it's making a difference, it really is and uh, 
nothing excites me more, frankly, than this focus on education that we are seeing from across sectors in our communities. And you know, it, one of the things I, s I spent 11 years on Kettering City Council, and I could never understand how it has come about that education has been so separated from every other function of local government. I mean, city council had nothing to do with schools. And what, yet, yeah, what was more important um, to the success of our community than our schools, which is kind of why they have their own entity, but that wall that has been built up, I think we're starting to, to break that down. And, and that's, that's important. That's really great. It, it absolutely is. Now, from a national, international perspective, how are we doing as a, t as a state, in your opinion, as far as educational attainment, mm -hmm. our workforce readiness? Well, you know, in spite of a lot of efforts, frankly, we haven't moved the needle very far. Um, I'd, I'd like to think we just have, I talked about patience earlier, and we have to keep doing what we're doing and we will see a difference. But the Lumina Foundation tells us, for example, that by 2020, um, six, we're going to need to meet our workforce needs. 60% of our people are going to need to have either a post, some sort of post-secondary credential, whether it's a two-year degree or a four-year degree or a certificate in something. They're going to need to have that. Right now, about 28% which is actually below the national average. About 28% of our folks have those credentials. Um, so we need to step that up. We need to make sure that everyone has access to that post-secondary education that has become so critical. Um, if we don't, we're going to continue to see this gap between the rich and the poor in this country continue um, to increase. And we, we can't allow that to happen. We can't. You know, we, we have businesses right now who are in desperate need of workers. Right. You know, who, right. who are not, you yeah. know, trained or qualified. Yeah. And, you know, you look at economic development efforts to uh, recruit companies to come here, and they want a workforce. Right. They want to know that they can right. fill those positions. Yeah. So it's so important. There's some 70,000 jobs right now on the Ohio Means Jobs um, yes. website that are going unfilled, and largely because people are not available in the right location with the right skills. And so we've got to marry those two, those two up. Absolutely. Now, how you've touched on this a little bit, but how have recent policy changes and initiatives improved our position as we rank nationally and internationally? Um, well, like I said, Ohio really hasn't moved up in any of those rankings specifically. Right. We're kind of right in the middle of the pack. We're not the worst, um, but we certainly aren't the best. And we can be. I think we have in Ohio one of the best higher education systems of any state in the country. We've got more universities, we've got more community colleges, and, and good ones. Um, so we're well positioned. Uh, we have to figure out the cost. The cost of education is just continuing to rise all the time. So we've got to figure that out. I think we have the will to do it. Uh, we just we just need to keep plugging and doing what we've been doing and and get that early childhood piece in there. That's that's key, and we've made some progress on that. Uh, we were able to fund um, uh, well. We got an additional thirty million dollars in the last um, budget towards the end there, specifically to increase slots in quality early childhood programs. We have a lot ways to go yeah. on that. Um, but lots of people working on it. So that's, that's kind of the key, and we have to just keep working on all of these pieces. And, and I think at some point we're going to start to take off, and I'd like to see us right up there with Massachusetts, which is no reason why we should let them be ahead of us. Absolutely. Why personally is education so important to you? Well, you know, it's kind of funny. I, I grew up actually in a schoolhouse. A lot of people don't know that <laughs> about me. <laughs> But um, education was important to my parents. My father was a college professor, my grandfather was a college professor, and my mother was a teacher. And um, when I was six years old, my parents started their own school um, because they weren't happy with what was available. Sure. And um, so our family moved into that school building. 
So I kind of grew up with discussions all the time around, centered around, you know, how do we improve and enhance and reform education. So it's kind of in my blood. Sure. So just do it. Well, we are so happy that you came here today to talk about education efforts. State Senator Peggy Laner, thank happy you. Happy to do it anytime. Oh, thank you for right. having me, Kathy. Thank you. This concludes Business Connection. I'm Kathy Peterson. Now stay tuned for an important message from the Dayton Area Chamber of Commerce. Today's program is highlighting education in our community and how important it is to connect the dots between a well-educated and trained community and the needs of our area employers. Education means different things to different people. Some think it's just a successful pre-K through 12 experience with a high school diploma. Some think of certifications and or community college completion, while others think of four years of college or more. In each case, all are correct. But what we know now is that employers want and need the very best educated, articulate, and motivated critical thinkers they can get in order to be competitive, whether on a local level or globally. To employers, education and training are a means to an end. The end product, successful employees and employment. The business community and this Chamber of Commerce remain actively engaged in this issue and have been for over 20 years. We must do everything we can to make sure our future employees and leaders have the best knowledge that they can have to compete in a world marketplace. This includes more emphasis on teaching, mentoring, higher educational standards, and skill sets. Our community deserves this from our elected leaders and from the business community.